This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, a podcast with a worldwide listenership that explores the broad world of preservation from every angle, from drones to mudlarking and everything in between. Now, let's get preserving. Like the rest of the internet, I came across Seamus Blackley's incredible story via Twitter and knew he'd make an incredible preserve cast guest. A true renaissance figure, Blackley is widely known as the father of the Xbox and has also spent several years perfecting the art of extracting yeast from an unusual environments to save and savor a taste of the past. A perfect slice of history for this week's preserve cast. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast, and today we're very excited to be talking with Seamus Blackley, who is uh, has been called the the father of the Xbox, um, but is also, uh, for our purposes, a student of what he describes and has been called as a gastro-Egyptology. Um, and so this is a really cool story that has been chronicled all across the globe, so we're really lucky to have you today to talk about this. Um, so how do you go from said father of Xbox to, um, gastro Egyptology? What is the spark of interest that takes you, um, along those lines? Well, I've always been interested in Egyptology in general. Um, and you know, there are various reasons for that, but one of the main one is that you can, you know, you can read what was on our ancestors' minds, you know, 4,500 or 5,000 years ago. Um, and you discover that they're really cool people that you'd probably want to know. And <clears throat> so that's been in the back of my mind for a long time. And I've been uh, sort of an amateur, um, you know, reader of hieroglyphics for decades. Um, and so it makes me basically, you know, um, an insufferable pedant whenever anything Egyptian comes up, you know, and I can like, you know, read what it says. Um, and, you know, but sometimes it's pretty funny. The uh, ancient Egyptians, because um, a lot of the characters in their, in their written language um, are pictures of stuff, um, had a great deal of fun with puns and uh, with like funny language. And so it's great to read that and see that humor. And also, you know, just uh, the irony of seeing an obelisk somewhere like in London and, you know, on the obelisk, it says, you know, this mighty monument has been placed here for eternity and shall never move. <laughs> you're like, yeah, but you're in London. I'm sorry. So, uh, so that's been going on for a long time. And also, uh, for a very long time, I've been, uh, kind of off and on a baker of bread and like a lot of nerdy people, um, I got involved with sourdough baking because it's a challenge. And I, I think more than the challenge, um, it's sourdough is interesting to technical people because it's explicitly not reducible into a set of rules. You have to do it by feel. You have to have an understanding of what's going on, you know, with the smell and, you know, the feel and the spirit of the thing in order to get the bread to work out right. You can't reduce it to, it as many people have tried, but you can't really successfully reduce it uh, to some set of variables you can optimize for. And that's good because it gives you a kind of a break from technical work because you have to, okay? Um, I used to do a lot of flying of airplanes and it was a similar kind of a thing. Not that it's not technical, it's obviously very technical, but when you get in the airplane and you take off, you have to let go of everything else and that's very healthy. And I think sourdough has the same thing. So as I was doing that in the usual way that I go about life, um, I got, you know, way too interested in it and way too, way too nerdy about it. And as a result, I started to collect my own yeast and sample different microbes in the environment. And then I got interested in trying to make medieval bread, um, i.e. can I make bread as good as a 12 year old could have made it in the 1300s? Uh, as, a, as a result of this idea that I had that maybe I should try making bread like people did in the 1300s. And, uh, and like, I, you know, like I said, try to be as good at making bread as a 12-year-old would have been in the 1300s. Um, I came across or was sent uh, by a friend of mine who's a beer brewer, a sample of ancient Egyptian yeast that had been used to brew beer. This, you know, fa famously, I guess in the 90s and early 2000s, there was this Daughters of Raw Beer, or so, you know, I mean, guys who make beer have these crazy names for their beers, and they're always puns, like ancient Egyptians. Um, and so I got this yeast sample, these brewers that apparently got from, like, scraping a pot or something of ancient Egyptian beer, okay? And, yeah, I was really naive at the time about all these things, so I thought, oh, that was great, I'll try baking with it. And, uh, you know, little did I know that, uh, that I knew nothing. 
<laughs> and and those brewers probably knew nothing either. Ancient Egyptian beer had nothing to do with what we think of as modern beer. And so even if you do have ancient Egyptian yeast, using it for a modern beer process doesn't give you anything remotely similar to what the ancient Egyptians would have drank, uh, except, uh, you know, maybe it has alcohol in it. And why is that? I mean, and I guess maybe as a, as a step back, just for everybody who knows, yeast is a living thing, but how does it survive such a well, long okay. period? So we'll get to that. So I, so, I, okay. so I took this stuff, this supposedly ancient Egyptian, I baked with it, I put it up on social media, and a bunch of people got really interested in it, including a lot of microbiologists and a lot of Egyptologists who actually knew something, which I didn't know anything about this stuff. And they were critical of me. They said, hey, you're, you know, how the hell do you know? What is you doing? You don't know what you're doing. And my wife said, yeah, you don't know what you're doing. And so I listened to that and I said, okay. So I reached out to the two loudest members of this sort of chorus of people telling me I was a moron. Um, and uh, one of them was a microbiologist, uh, Natasha Amara, and another one um, is an Egyptologist uh, um, and um, asked them what I should do. You know, what, what, what don't I know? How could we actually do this? And so we started collaborating as a result of Twitter. Um, and we came up with a plan that might actually, you know, net us some real ancient Egyptian microbes. So some of the microbes these guys used to make beer and bread, which is central, very important to their economy and their culture. Um, and so Natasha came up with uh, a regimen for, um, for non-destructively sampling um, some brewing and baking pottery. And we can talk a little bit more about that. And Dr. Serena Love, the Egyptologist, um, basically very kindly risked her reputation um, getting me invited to go to museums with important collections of Old Kingdom, of very, very old ancient Egyptian brewing and baking pottery uh, to try out this crazy scheme. Um, and uh, and so, so we did that. Um, and the idea is basically that you take advantage of the fact that a lot of these microbes, yeast is among them, and the, the bacteria that are symbiotic with the yeast that creates what we call sourdough, um, can go dormant for very long periods of time uh, if they're removed from water and if they're not too hot. Um, in fact, yeast spores have been taken into space and exposed to vacuum and they come back uh, and they can be revived and they can replicate. Uh, and the same thing is true with a lot of the bacteria that are in this mix that gets used for, uh, for sourdough baking. And I should point out that, um, that all bread prior to the Industrial Resolution, Revolution, all bread prior to the Industrial Revolution or a little bit before uh, was sourdough. It was naturally uh, based fermentation. Um, you know, you find this the yeast and these other bacteria growing on the grain themselves. I mean, you know, it doesn't, humans are not needed for fermentation to take place. These bacteria and microorganisms feed on yeast grain in the field. And so they're existent on that, on that grain in the field. And it's most likely that if you get it wet and let it sit for a while, that fermentation will start sort of automatically because they're in the environment. Uh, and hence, we have beer and bread and other fermented foods all across the world, all throughout history, all throughout cultures, which is lucky because it's a lot of the reason that we're here today. A lot of the reason that we were able to build the food economy that lets us, you know, use our minds and do all that stuff. Nonetheless, a lot of people, you know, seem to think that sourdough was invented in San Francisco and that it's some kind of specialty kind of bread. And they don't understand that all bread was sourdough until, you know, 100 years ago or maybe 150 years ago, which is nothing in the span of human history, right? So the thing we think of as bread today would be unrecognizable in many ways to every other human that had ever lived prior to, you know, 1800 or so, uh, which is kind of interesting to think about. In any case, the good thing is that this, these micro, these, these little guys can, can, can live if they're in the right conditions. And it turns out, we think, that those conditions exist inside the pore structure, inside the ceramic matrix in the wall of baking and brewing vessels of, of these terracotta clay baking vessels. So the idea is you're brewing beer, you know, for the guys working on the pyramids, or you're baking bread, you're fermenting the, the dough, and moisture seeps into the porous surface of these, you know, very quickly made, you know, sort of ancient Egyptian plastic um, vessels. And they break. So you throw them in the trash heap, and you make more and you keep going. And in the case of the pyramids, you know, they had, you know, 80 or 90,000 workers at any given time, so there was a lot of brewing and baking going on and a lot of broken vessels. We find trash heaps the size of houses 
okay? So inside that ceramic, if the moisture, if the water in the beer or in the bread dough had seeped into it, carrying these microbes inevitably, they would become lodged in the ceramic matrix on the inside of these, of these walls of pottery. And inside there, buried in the trash heap, in the dry conditions in Egypt, under dirt, those microbes could become dormant and just sit there. And the world changes and modern wheat is invented and yeast changes and everything's domesticized and commercial yeasts come out and we pollute the environment. All that stuff happens and they're buried and they're fine and they're protected. So it's likely, we believe, that if we're careful, um, we can extract those and revive them just like the people who took yeast to space revived the space yeast and you know just like you can do with commercial dried yeast that's sitting in your freezer or your refrigerator so how do you actually take the sample is it some type i mean you must have to wear gloves and you're trying not to cross contaminate it because i know i've read that you've actually had to then go back through and do sampling to make sure that you didn't pick up a modern yeah. yeast because there's other stuff just in the air yeah, right? there's just the, yeast the, yeah, everywhere the, like the the when we when we suit up to do this it's not um it, it's to protect the sample, not to protect us, right? All of right. This, the, the stuff that we have on our bodies and everything that's in the air uh, is going to contaminate, you know, these, these potentially um, time capsule preserved organisms, right? And so the way we extract them actually makes it even more dangerous necessarily because what we do is we sort of inject um, uh, a, a warm fluid containing nutrients um, into the ceramic matrix. And we let it sit um, so that these guys get hydrated. They maybe start to metabolize a little bit. They kind of wake up. Um, they get dislodged from wherever it is they're jammed inside the matrix. And then we sort of vacuum them back out with this fluid. And so it's very, very, very important during that phase that we keep everything sterile because this fluid is sort of rocket fuel for yeast and these other microbes. So we don't want anything else falling into that. So we get a good clean sample. Now, inevitably, you know, there's museum dust and things on the surface of these uh, of these vessels on the surface of the ceramic, which is most likely, by the way, what the beer guys scraped off, <laughs> you know, and they made beer with museum dust, which is fine. You just call it museum dust beer, don't call it ancient beer. But, um, uh, uh, you know, once you have those samples, then you can go to the microbiology lab and through a series of techniques uh, that are pretty well understood in microbiology, you can separate out the stuff that's obviously a contaminant by looking under a microscope, the way it forms colonies, stuff that you recognize, um, and then whittle it down until you're doing DNA analysis and RNA analysis on individual samples to make sure that you've, you've separated out something that's unique and could be old. You can then do analysis of that RNA sequence to see if it is old because you can kind of tell um, through various really clever methodologies in DNA and RNA analysis how old an organism probably is. And so you've gotten to that level of the RNA and DNA analysis and confirmed that, yes, you're dealing with something that is truly Egyptian or at least of that time period or something so yeah, that is. Yes and no. So we've gotten to that point. Uh, but COVID interrupted all of our analysis stuff. So, um, you know, I would say it's unlikely that we've captured um, a genuinely ancient sample so far. Um, but we're just at the very beginnings of the process. You know, why the, would you say that that's unlikely? Just the physicist in me knows that you don't get a great result after like three three samples. Okay, so you need right. to go do a lot more work. And the vessels that we got to. Um, you know, have been in storage for a very long time in museums and likely have been contaminated. They may have been irradiated. You just don't know. And so the trick really is to build up a very large, carefully collected sample library and look at it and get some skill doing the analysis so that you can trust the result. I mean, look, if we hit the jackpot um, and we got something that's genuinely old very early on, then that's magnificent. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, but it's, you know, it's unlikely that that's the case. Um, and so, you know, really when I, when I stole this, this sample out of our samples and decided to bake with it, that was a test to see, you know, if we got something at all. Um, and we did some analysis. I mean, we saw there were different strains of yeast. Um, Natasha sampled out, you know, just looking at the, the way the cultures grew, the culture that she thought was most likely um, unusual. Okay, and that's the one that, that I've been practicing baking with, but it's really just practice. And that's why in all my Twitter uh, streams and everywhere that I talk about this, I'm really careful to say that we don't know yet. You know, it could be ancient, 
But the program is to do a huge amount of sampling and a huge amount of analysis so that we can really be sure and we can have statistical certainty, right? Some degree of statistical, um, you know, confidence um, that we have something that's actually old. Okay. So you've, you've baked medieval bread with some degree of certainty, I suppose. You've baked, obviously, this, this potentially Egyptian bread. We don't know exactly yet. What's the flavor profile like? Like if you were to describe this to someone, like you said earlier, which I thought was interesting, is that the bread we eat today, um, the, or the vast majority of bread that's eaten today, would not even be, you know, if you were to go back to antiquity, they wouldn't even recognize that as bread. Yeah, and they, um, probably, they would probably love it. They would think it's great. But it's also, <laughs> you know, um, that there's a difference. I mean, you know, you get some bread and that was your meal for the day. And so it had to be, you know, pretty substantial, a pretty substantial thing, right? Um, and also, you know, the, the, uh, the availability of ingredients was, was, was zero, you know, I mean, if you were in Poland in the 1300s, you know, you might have rye and water and you might barter for some salt and okay, you need to feed your family now. And so you need to be a very, you know, capable baker and you can make 100% sourdough rye breads, like naturally leavened rye breads. Uh, and I, you can look at my Twitter feed. I practiced that for years to be able to do that. You can make them. They're very nice. They're fluffy. They're super delicious. Um, you know, my kids will eat them. Um, they're very filling. They're very, you know, they're very rich. Uh, they're not dense. You know, wh one of the things that's really interesting is that a lot of people who don't know very much about, you know, baking with these kinds of, uh, you know, heirloom grains, the flour that you get in the supermarket um, has, it has a few properties that most people don't understand. First of all, um, your average sort of all-purpose flour is very highly engineered product. Um, it's been, uh, you know, genetically engineered in various ways, either just through, you know, crossbreeding or through actual genuine, gen, you know, uh, uh, genetic analysis for decades or even hundreds of years to be extremely effective for making bread and to have a high gluten content and to be very easy to use. It's also highly extracted, meaning that only uh, a percentage of the actual milled wheat is in it. Uh, all of the fibrous stuff, all of the stuff that might, you know, poke little holes in the bubbles that are forming when you're making any kind of bread, whether it's, you know, quick bread like biscuits or brownies or, or bread bread, um, has been removed. That's why it's so smooth and powdery and white, okay? Um, if you actually take wheat and just mill it, you get that stuff in there, but you get everything else as well. And, um, and, you know, to, to some extent, this is why we have like, you know, bran flakes and other products that have bran in them and it's seen as so healthy is because we took it out of the place that humans have been getting it since the beginning of, 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 of you know, any kind of agri agrarian economy, which is in the bread because it's in there with the, with the flour. So my point is that learning how to make bread that isn't like a puck um, that contains all of that stuff is a trick. And, you know, it's not spectacularly difficult you know you don't have to be some sort of bread genius to do it but you have to have a little different mentality and you have to make bread in a different way you have to learn how to do that and use those skills and so when you do that you come up with this bread that's like really good um and unlike the kind of you know horrible bread that people make and say oh this is ancient bread and it's just terrible that's because they didn't know how to make bread in the first place. Um, if you know how to make these kinds of breads and then you use the, the old techniques, you discover that these people were really smart and they made really, really good bread. Um, and it's, it's, not, it's not really that surprising, you know? Um, the, the Roman Empire um, inherited the grain called emmer um, that was used by the ancient Egyptians to bake. And emmer bread, basically fueled the Roman army as it took over the world. And you can imagine a giant, you know, war veteran Roman centurion is not going to be very happy if you hand him a crappy piece of bread as his daily meal. So, you know, uh, uh, I think ancient baking has to take into account the fact that the bread had to be really good. And so how, well, I guess two questions. How often do you bake like this? Is it pretty regular for you? And then how do you actually get the baking done of some of these ancient breads? Is it, do they go in your oven? Do you have an outdoor oven? How do you actually handle the baking to try and get, do you try and match that to 
the style of baking or are you using modern ovens? Um, well, so you use, a, uh, you, you use everything, right? So I use the modern oven all the time um, to try stuff out um, and to ensure that things are working. Um, and the Romans used ovens, the Europeans used ovens, so all the medieval stuff, you know, that was the common technology there. When we roll the, the, the Wayback Machine back to the Old Kingdom uh, in Egypt, um, people weren't using ovens to bake bread yet. Um, and it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, you know, you think, oh, these people were so primitive, they hadn't even invented, you know, the oven yet. And, and it's not the case. Like, they had made ovens, they just didn't think that that was a good way to cook bread. You know, they, they made special pottery and they baked the bread in that pottery and they got these fabulous shapes um, uh, in the bread that they made. And in, in fact, one of the things m many people don't realize about ancient Egypt, which was a culture that lasted nearly 5,000 years, uh, was that they had no currency. You know, we don't find ancient Egyptian coins. OK, it was a barter economy. and It was a very advanced barter economy in point of fact. We have financial records and disputes and everything you could imagine, but it was nonetheless a barter economy. And so um, when you are baking loaves that are going to be used as currency, you want them to be a standardized size. And so having standardized pottery that are baked in ensures that like, nobody gets swindled. And that was really taken forward. You've probably seen um, these beautiful segmented Roman loaves um, that actually have a stamp on them. Similar thing, right? That that idea had been inherited from the Egyptians up into the Roman Empire through the Greeks. So in any case, uh, these guys baked the bread um, using uh, coals uh, that were arranged around um, things called bedje, which were uh, specific sort of conically shaped baking vessels that are kind of uh, cylindrical on the outside and conical on the inside. It turns out there are very good thermodynamic reasons for the conical shape. Um, that you can see on my Twitter feed. I've shown how the, the thermodynamics of that work out because I was interested in it. Um, and the, uh, the scale on which you can bake bread in this way is astonishing because if you're not limited to the, the size of an oven, right, then you can have, you know, football field size bakeries with all of these beds out and you have guys just putting ashes around them and they're taking up the ones that are done. And there's a guy behind them putting new ones in place and behind them putting new ashes in. And so you have an operation where you can, where you can imagine feeding 90,000 workers. And we find those uh, around Giza on the Giza Plateau near the pyramids in these villages that were built to house these guys who are actually off season farmers doing basically public works. It's kind of like the New Deal is what the pyramids were. These guys had government work for one season while the fields were flooding, and then they went back to the fields and farmed. But you have to feed them all. And so they were able to do it with this huge scale. So I think if you went to them and said, hey, how come you're not using an oven? They'd look at you like you're a lunatic. <laughs> we, we, what do you mean? One oven? How, there's no what? So um, it's important to remember that these guys weren't stupid just because they didn't have iPhones. You know, They built... They built the tallest building in the world until the Eiffel Tower, right? Uh, it was the tallest building in the world for almost 6,000 years or 5,000 years. Crazy. What happened to that style of bread baking? Does that, does that persist or exist anywhere left in the world or did it kind of go with it with that civilization? Well, people still bake, um, you know, bake bread and all sorts of stuff in clay pots, right? It's just sort of a more niche thing. It's not the most common way of baking anymore. Um, also remember, you know, the Egyptian empire lasted a very, very long time. By the time of Cleopatra, who was the last official pharaoh of the Egyptian empire, uh, there was something like 200 words for bread. And cooking styles had radically changed. Most bread was baked in an oven at that point. They were still making, you know, fabulous, like, animal-shaped cakes. And, you know, they, they would bake loaves of bread with dates in it that were, like, full-size baboons in the shape of a baboon in, a, in an oven mold of the baboon. We see depictions of this and we find remnants of this in tombs and they're fabulous bakers, like really unbelievably skilled bakers. And, you know, as you can imagine, if you've seen some of the jewelry found in Tutankhamun's tomb or, 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 or some of the royal jewelry, that always, it's always fun to go to the museum and watch people react to this jewelry and the craftsmanship and be sort of surprised that, oh my gosh, you know, that's even more intricate than anything I see today. You know, these were very, very skilled human beings. Again, they weren't stupid just because they didn't have jet flames. Um, and that skill would have extended into food as well. The, you know, the cakes and breads would have been like utterly magnificent.
Well, it's probably a good place to take a quick break and then come right back and uh, wrap up this and talk about what's what's next and what's on the uh, the bucket baking list. Um, and we'll do that right here on PreserveCast. PreserveCast would like to thank McDo Preservation LLC for sponsoring today's episode. McDo specializes in program development and evaluation, long-range planning, and capacity building for nonprofit and government clients. To learn more about McDo's data and community-driven approach and commitment to equity, visit mcdo.com. That's M-C-D-O-U-X.com. We want to thank Oliver Pluff & Company for sponsoring today's episode of PreserveCast. Oliver Pluff & Company tells the story of historic American beverages, including teas, spice drinks, cacao, and coffee for historic sites, national parks, gourmet markets, and consumers looking for a great beverage hand-packaged in signature artisan tins to enjoy a cup of history and learn more about what Oliver Pluff & Company offers, please visit oliverpluff.com. That's Oliver Pluff, spelled P-L-U-F-F dot com. Also, before we get back to the episode, we're pleased to offer our listeners a 10% off discount on all Oliver Pluff teas, toddies, cacaos, and coffees. Just use the code PRESERVECAST at checkout. That's P-R-E-S-E-R-V-E-C-A-S-T at checkout over at oliverpluff.com. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast today. We're thrilled to be talking with Seamus Blackley um, all about the work that he's done and the incredible research in partnership with folks around the world um, to figure out how to sort of unravel the history of different bread uh, going as far back as the Egyptians. Um, Before we took our break, we talked a little bit about... um, different styles of baking and the the unique ways in which the Egyptians bake. So is Egyptian bread as far back as you can pretty much go? Is there earlier bread? What's on the, I mean, obviously you want to get it right and you want to make sure that you're actually truly baking with Egyptian yeast. And I know we talked about how that sampling process will continue, but what else is on the, the bread bucket baking list? (laughs) Well, first, you know, we want to do a good job with the, the Egyptian old kingdom baking. Once we do that, you know, who knows? That's that's a lot of work. There's still a lot of work to be done uh, perfecting the process of baking. Um, you know, that kind of experimental archaeology. There's a huge amount of microbiology to be done. Um, DNA and RNA analysis are no joke. But you know, there are definitely earlier examples of bread baking, and they come up all the time. Um, you know, hilariously, uh, in Australia, there's recently uh, an article about you know super early Aboriginal or, or pre-Aboriginal bread baking. And I'm not an expert in that, so I could be misspeaking, but um, the reason I say hilarious is that it seems always the Australians are saying that they have the earliest thing. Um, and uh, it may be true. I don't know. But they're very proud of that. So, you know, that's something to look into. And the problem really is that this special set of circumstances with ancient Egypt, um, the combination of, you know, our knowledge of their culture through their writings and then the things they've left over, the natural environment that tends to preserve these things, the scale of their civilization that gives us so many opportunities to sample, right? And also just, you know, generally all the descriptions that we have of what the breads looked like, you know, uh, how it worked, how it was used um, is very helpful. That's less true as we go further back in time. So I think this is a really good place to start study of this ancient bread. And to be totally honest with you, my point in all this wasn't to study ancient bread. My point in all this was that, you know, I really have a ton of respect for the ancient Egyptians and I I feel a great deal of uh, connection to them because they did the first thing so many times, right? First huge bureaucracy, first government works projects. And, you know, you can argue in small ways with all these things, but did all of these things at the same time. Really first stone structures and then you know, within a couple of generations, they were making pyramids, um, and the pyramids are just astonishingly impressive, um, and, and, and on and on and on and on and on. And it's an incredible thrill for me to think that we could have an experience of, you know, reading what was on their mind, reading this beautiful poetry, reading the thoughts they had about life, and being able to effectively share a meal with them, and really, really have a sense of what that was like. That's very powerful. And that's really my goal. It's maybe less like, you know, nerdy and scientific than you want, but that's really my goal. 
No, no. I think, I mean, I think it, it makes, it makes perfect sense. And, um, you know, there, there's, there's, uh, few ways of, of becoming, uh, having more of a kinship and an affinity for a historic period than eating something from that period and trying to kind of commune with that. And in this case, it would be, you know, be doing that on a level that hasn't been done in, in, in four or 5,000 years. I'm curious if, if it works, could you then propagate the yeast and sell, not that this is a money-making venture, but could there be a way for that yeast then to be sort of duplicated, even though it would be a modern duplication of it? Is there a way that then that could be shared once you determine, yes, this is, we found what was the yeast then? Yeah, well, and let me assure you, this is probably a money-losing operation at the moment. Yeah. This, is like <laughs> this is that a great sort of amateur science thing. Um, so I guess a few things. Um, first of all, um, you know, really, I, I, I like this project so much because it's employing a lot of different um, disciplines in science toward the goal of something emotional, which is the goal of, of essentially sharing a meal with your distant ancestors, right? An emotional goal using the tools of science, which I really like. Um, and it's important to use those tools of science so you can have some certainty that you're really having the experience that you wanted to have, right? It's kind of like the equivalent of, you know, being able to prove that the bungee cable that you're about to jump on isn't going to fail so that you can enjoy the terrifying experience with the knowledge in the back of your head that it's going to be okay. Um, that said, you know, it's really with this ancient Egyptian um, situation that we have a unique opportunity to do that. There are plenty of people who try to replicate food from the past. And you kind of can, but you don't know exactly what the ingredients were in a lot of cases. Um, and you can't so clearly uh, kind of get into the right specific bucket and field to ensure that you're really going to get the same result. You know, like we have um, grains of emmer um, that were left in tombs and we've done analysis of them and we know we can grow emmer that's the same genetic emmer as that within the side, you know, percentage error. So that's, that's handled. If we can get the right microbes, then that's handled. We know how to bake uh, and we can experimentally determine how to bake bread that comes out like it should in the pots that are exactly the same as the ones that they use. So we can be pretty sure we're like spot on here. And that's not true when trying to replicate a lot of other ancient cuisine. So it's a pretty special situation, to be honest. Uh, and it also happens to be the most important staple in their diet and economy during the time that they were building the Great Pyramids, which is super compelling. So it's a really special kind of a thing. Now, uh, the, the real question you're asking is whether or not this can be shared. And so a couple words about that. First of all, even though these are very old organisms, like a lot of old organisms, including old seeds that we find from the Neolithic period, let's say. Um, you know, they're seeds. The, the, the dormant yeast cells are seeds. When you wake them up again, they replicate and they make more. And what you're making is brand new copies of an ancient organism. So it's the same as the ancient organism was, but they're new. So it's the same as planting the seeds from the Neolithic and a plant will sprout. It's a brand new plant. You can eat it, it's safe, everything, everything's normal about it. It's just one that you won't find today because the seed got preserved. And so that can certainly be shared because it will make more seeds and you can collect those. And if you plant those, they'll make that same plant. Same thing with the yeast. All of that said, um, so many of these artifacts that we've sampled were looted from Egypt, right? They were taken by you know, various and sundry governments around the world who went and did scientific expeditions, more or less scientific expeditions over the centuries to ancient Egypt and brought things back home, okay? And, you know, it's unethical and it's morally wrong for a huge number of reasons. Um, but it's complicated because, you know, returning those artifacts to Egypt has all sorts of political problems, you know, and other ethical and moral problems, preservation problems, et cetera. So it's a very complicated issue. But I think everyone can agree that the right thing, the right place for those things to be is in Egypt. You know, it's the reason that Tutankhamun has never been removed from his tomb, um, which would be disrespectful to remove him from his tomb. So our intention is to do all this work, and then if we are able to get a series of actual organisms that have been used to bake and brew in the Old Kingdom, those belong in Egypt. In fact, 
they don't belong to Egypt. They belong to the baker and the brewer who made them and, you know, who made those pots, right? It's not ours. So we can do all that work and we're doing it for free and we're going to do it because it's the right thing to do and because we're interested in it. But we need to be respectful of that person. We need to be respectful of the person who built that giant bakery in Giza and fed all those guys and, you know, built all that up. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I think that, that gets right at the core of the ethics and the morality of preservation and um, this kind of work. And I think that listeners will find that really fascinating. So um, if people want to learn more about what you're doing, your baking, keep up with you, where's the best place to find you? It's all on my Twitter account. Um, unfortunately, for better or worse. Um, I like to put things there because it's a it's an interactive conversation. And, you know, there are other side projects that happen. Um, I've done a pretty, uh, uh, <laughs> like more than you ever wanted to know about making Appalachian baguettes, uh, for instance, uh, and more than you ever wanted to know about making, um, you know, original sort of Polish Ashkenazi bagels, uh, recently this weekend, actually, uh, really boring, long, you know, dissertations into how to do these old foods. Uh, and the reason it's on Twitter is because it's interactive and we can talk about it. It's interesting. So we will put a link in the show notes. People can click there, get there. Um, and we ask this of everybody who comes on, your favorite historic place or site? My favorite historic place or site? Um, boy, you know, that's really difficult. Um, I would say my favorite historic site uh, is uh, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. Um, and, uh, you know, seeing the the skill that the uh, Anasazi had in building that and the skill that they had in locating it where it was and sort of feeling the tragic mystery of why that culture suddenly collapsed uh, is very, very powerful. And it's not a place that a lot of people go. So I would encourage you to go and experience it and support them. Well, that is a fantastic ending. A really interesting conversation. We'll have to have you back um, as as you continue to bake and perhaps as you get some results um, when they, they can start doing RNA sequencing. Once they're done with the, the RNA for COVID, they can return back to uh, RNA yeah, that's sequencing the, on the bread. Trick isn't, the trick isn't really sequencing. The trick is then you have this sequence, which is this giant file full of the same letter over and over again. And what does it mean? That's the problem. Yeah. Well, this has been great. I appreciate your time and uh, look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Take care. Nice meeting you. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to PreserveCast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening and keep on preserving.